Ja, alldeles strax så ska ni få möta författaren Gerda Anti som kommer med sin nya bok Livet omkring. Men först så ska ni få se en intervju med en mycket spännande och lovprisad författare. Hon heter Nadifa Mohammed och hon har tecknat ett mycket skarpt porträtt av en hel nation genom att beskriva tre olika kvinnors öden. Och det här handlar om det krigsdrabbade Somalia. Det handlar om en enka som själv begraver sina barn. En kvinnlig soldat som förtvivlat håller fast vid att regimen är den rätta. Och en liten nioårig flicka som söker skydd undan svält och misshandel. Romanen har fått lysande recensioner och hennes roman heter Förlorade själar. Så här sa hon när jag träffade henne. Welcome to my show. Thank you. Nadifa Mohammed who has written uh, the novel in Swedish Förlorade själar Lost Souls. And it's a very uh, moving story about three women in Somalia. Mm -hmm. And you kind of follow their stories. They are parallel in a sort of, and sometimes they meet. Mm. Yes. And they are very different and live very different lives. If, if you would introduce them, uh, if we take Filson, who is uh, maybe the most complicated character in your novel. Yeah, she's a young woman in her 30s who is from Mogadishu, very well educated, very politically aware, committed to the ideals that the government is trying to um, make work in Somalia. So she's a feminist in some ways. She's a progressive in her, mm -hmm. in her mind, but is also engaged in a lot of violence. Mm -hmm. And she thinks this is the right way yes. to uh, fulfill her dreams, sort of, as a woman Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, yes. So she's not ever really had the ability to fulfill the traditional role of a woman to be a mother and a wife. Her father raised her very differently. Mm -hmm. So she's got all of her hopes up in this, mm -hmm. in this new Somalia mm -hmm. that the government says that they're trying to create. Mm -hmm. This is the, in the end of the 80, 1980. Yes. Uh, would you describe for our viewers the situation in Somalia during that time? Well, Filson's perspective is actually quite unusual for most people, um, including uh, my family and um, relatives in Hargeisa, it was a very different reality. People were abducted from home at night. There were regular raids by the police. Uh, money was taken, goods were taken. There were disappearances, executions, a curfew, that, which I think was at 7 p.m. at one point and then moved to 4 p.m. So life was becoming more and more impossible by the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And we can come back to Filson because I think she's an interesting character mm -hmm. as well. Because what violence do to a person is also interesting. Yes, I was interested in that. Uh, Canvasar is another uh, bit older woman, and she's having quite a good life. She had a good life. She had a good life. She had a good life. So she was. Um, she's a Hargeisa resident, born and bred. Feels very connected to this small city. But her life has declined as the city has declined. Mm -hmm. So she she was from a pretty privileged background, but wanted to be a wife and mother. That was she had her this aspiration. fantastic fruit garden. Yes, an orchard. But under the fruit trees, there is a terrible story of her life. Yes, absolutely. Most of her dreams are buried under those fruit trees. She wanted to have a big family, mm -hmm. a wide family, but had one child who she lost. Her, her husband has gone. Everyone has gone, mm -hmm. apart from her best friend, the Habo. Mm -hmm. So she's a tragic figure mm -hmm. who I think sim uh, she's a symptom of all of the hope that people had for this mm -hmm. new country that by the late 80s had mm -hmm. died. She's a, like a metaphor of, of Somalia. I, I, I would say or? she's a metaphor. I think her orchard is probably more of a metaphor. Okay. But um, Kausa feels very real to me. She feels a very full-blooded character. Mm -hmm. Deco. Yes. She's young. She's a very young girl. Yeah. And she's also part of uh, Somalia, the picture of Somalia. Mm -hmm. Because she's um, vulnerable very much as a child. Yes. And, and uh, there is a, a situation where Kansva is trying to save her, which uh, she has paid a high Big price, price for. Absolutely. I think Kausa has had her fill of the brutality and the bullying and oppression of the government at that point, and um, Dergos just happens to be there, and she tries to help her. 
But I think Dergo, in the end, becomes the person with the most resilience, the most hope, the most, um, I think, the person that any kind of future for, mm. the, for that nation will depend on. Mm is someone who can absorb all of that and still carry on. Mm -hmm. A survivor, really. She is a survivor. Why did you write this story? I mean, because uh, you live a totally different life, but you have a family story. Yes. Your family has experienced a lot of these things. Yes, so a lot of the facts that I used in the novel came from interviews with my mother, my aunts, people I met in Hargeisa. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is based on real events. And the central event that basically formed this novel for me was something that happened to my grandmother, where when we left um, Hargeisa in 86, she'd been hit by a car and left bedbound. And we left her, we thought, with enough care to make sure that her needs were met. But then just two years later, when the war broke out and the government was bombarding the city, everyone fled for their lives and people like my grandmother were left behind. Mm. So I don't know exactly for how long, but for some time she was left there in her bed waiting, I guess, for a bomb to fall through the ceiling until she was rescued by her niece. So this was like Kausar, who yes. is also bound yeah. to the bed and, mm -hmm. and left. Yeah. And this is like a wound, it seems. I think so. That you abandoned uh, your grandmother, sort of. You didn't think it would be like that, but no. it became like that. My uncle was there and our family was there, so it felt as if we were, we were the ones out there mm. on a limb in the UK, but in the end, when the war broke out, very vulnerable people like my grandmother were left abandoned, mm. and I think that does a lot to society mm. when, you know, responsibilities you had are suddenly not met. You live a totally different life today in, in Great Britain, and you've done that uh, since 86, mm -hmm. or, yeah. You know. um, how integrated are the Somalis in, in Great Britain? I think it's a complicated picture. My father arrived in the UK in 1947, before the big wave of migration from the West Indies or India. So he was there very early on, which helped us in lots of ways. Um, people who arrived in the 1990s as refugees, they had a much harder time. You know, there was a lot of um, violence, anti-immigration feeling in the 90s. So that sense of conflict was much greater. I didn't. I don't. I don't think I've seen much conflict. It's been quite an easy process for me mm. to live in England. <clears throat> I know that you don't know the conditions for Somalis here in Sweden, but they are not as integrated at all as mm -hmm. in Great Britain, Canada, and the US. Uh, but what I think of when I read, when I read about these three women, is that you you never know when you meet a person on the bus today, on the street, yes. on the train what kind of uh, stories they are carrying. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm always surprised. I'm one of those people who does talk to strangers on the bus and things like that. And I remember talking with a young Somali man about something very banal about London. And then suddenly he just um, changed tone and started telling me about being a young boy in Mogadishu during the fighting there and approaching... Oh, during this period of...? Just after, just so after. 91, 92. Mm. And he had to approach this checkpoint and pass it but he knew that if they knew who he was, they would kill him. Mm. So he had to quickly think, as a 10, 11-year-old, um, how he could change his background and how he could survive it. And he's just there in London now, living his life very ordinary, but with this trauma, with these memories just circulating underneath the surface. Mm. What do you do with these wounds? For me, I write them. <laughs> yeah, you write them. I, right? I've got a but maybe way he, of dealing he did them. the same thing by telling his story. Yes, yes, and that's quite unusual. I think most people lock them away, mm -hmm. and I don't think that's a very healthy approach. Mm -hmm. When I went to Hargeisa, you know, it's, it's surprising how little is spoken about mm -hmm. that period of time, because it's the case also with people who survived the Holocaust. They didn't talk about it for decades often, and when you're really traumatized. You need, you need time, I think, to face it. Mm. I, can, I can face that trauma with more simplicity, I think, because it's not as visceral. Mm. And you can interview your relatives yes. instead. Yes, yeah. What kind of reactions have you had on your novel among Somalis? Generally positive. Mm. I think people are very happy that these stories are being told. Um, I know that I'm doing it from a slight remove. I'm working in the UK. I visit Hargeisa and do research there. Mm. and I'm very connected to the Somali community. Mm in the UK. So I don't, I always feel that because these are stories that emanated from my own family, they're also part of my history. They're not something outside of me. 
Mm. They're very much within me. We are talking a lot about Holocaust now and about children and grandchildren of people that were part of it. Is it the same kind of story for you? That you are not directly connected to the yes. story, but you are still close? I think so, and I think so, and I think a lot of the trauma reappears in the children, the grandchildren. You know, I'm really interested in writers such as Primo Levi and how he describes suffering from depression in Italy, mm -hmm. but not in Auschwitz. And then that depression reappeared much later on in his life mm -hmm. and how our, our minds deal with this and how they operate. It's very fascinating. So I think the young generation of Somalis who are raised in the UK are often successful. I, I meet very successful people doing well academically, professionally, creatively. But just under the surface, there's mm. something else going on. What happened with you when you wrote this story? In what sense? Mm. Oh, I mean, emotionally. Oh, it was amazing. Um, the first story I wrote was about my father and covered 10 different countries and all of these different experiences. So we became much closer in mm. that process. And with this one, um, I interviewed my mother at the beginning and she didn't really feel that her, her story, her history had any value. She was just a housewife, she thought but she gave me this incredible description of um, the first time the Somali flag was raised after the British left, about all of the hopes and dreams people had in the 70s for their new country. She was there um, when Ethiopian planes were flying overhead in the late 70s, so she saw it all. She was a first-hand witness to history. So all of this kind of makes me feel more complete as a person, mm. knowing this. And closer to your parents. Yeah. Mm. It's really an eye-opener. It's a very moving story, but also an eye-opener what people are carrying around, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of stories they have. And maybe it's time to ask them. I think so. And if they would like to tell or ready for that, they will do probably. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank for you. Being in my show.